Hello boys and girls, and today we are going to be talking about evolutionary theorists, how we got to today's theory of evolution. James Hutton, born in 1726, died in 1797. He proposed the theory of geological change, which says that layers of rock, example sandstone, form very slowly, and that the forces beneath the Earth's surface will move up some rocks, bury them, and push them up from the seafloor to form mountains. So he had the idea of the fault line. If you look over here, you can see some of his thoughts uh, right here. So here we have the uh, striations in the water and the layers of rock in canyons. And we can see the differences of and how old certain layers of rocks are. He also said gradualism, which is processes today are the same as they are in the past. So large changes are the accumulation of slow, continuous, continuous processes. For example, erosion. The large changes are through the continuous process of erosion. Now, Charles Lyell. He had a principle of geology which says that past events must be explained by using processes that can be observed so that we can see. And since processes shape Earth millions of years earlier continue in the past. So volcanoes release hot lava and gases now, just like they did in the past. Erosion continues to carve out caverns and canyons. Now, uniformitarianism is processes that occur today have always occurred. So volcanoes that do their processes today have occurred in the past and exactly as they do today. Or the water cycle has always gone in the past just like it does today. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, he was a naturalist or what uh, we would also call a biologist today. Uh, he said the inheritance of acquired characteristics in 1809. And this is that we inherit characteristics from our parents. And so their traits get passed to us. Now, while he had a right start on thinking, it wasn't necessarily correct. Because what he's saying is, if your dad is six foot two, then you need you will be six foot two, which we know isn't true. He said that we have a tendency towards perfection, which organisms have an innate tendency to get towards complexity and perfection. So we are continually changing and acquiring features that help them live more successfully in their environments. Sounds great, but what he's saying here is that a giraffe is going to continually grow its neck to where it can reach the leaves. And then because it grew to a certain length, then its child will grow to a certain length and then it will continue to grow to reach where it needs to go, which isn't necessarily what work, how that works. So Lamarck's theory of evolution says the ancestor of birds acquired an urge to fly and over many generations, birds kept trying to fly and their wings increased in size and became more suited to flying. What this is stating is that birds were trying to fly, so they turned their wings into, or forelimbs into wings to make them more suited for flying. And that's not necessarily how this works, uh, which while his theory of evolution is uh, great as a starting point, it does have its flaws. So we then have use and disuse. Organisms can alter the size or shape of organs by using their bodies in new ways. For example, birds would try to use their front limbs for flying and eventually those limbs would transform into wings or if a wings, winged animal did not use its wings or disuse, the wings would disappear, disagree, decrease in size and then eventually disappear over generations. Um, you see here that this is a penguin. This penguin is a null example due to the fact that the penguin still flies. It just flies underwater. So it uses it to swim. 
but because of Lamarck's theory, his saying that they will eventually transform into wings, and since it's not being used for flying, those wings will eventually disappear, which their their wings are still going and strong because the way of flying has changed. Inheritance of acquired traits. If an animal alters its body during its lifetime, leading to longer legs or fluffier feathers, that would pass the change onto its offspring. And this is where the biggest problem comes into play because this is saying like, if I'm six foot two, uh, my child will be six foot two and it will grow and continue to grow taller and that will be passed on. That's the inheritance. So by this reasoning, if I spent most of my life lifting weights to build muscles, my children would inherit those big muscles. Like I said, he had a great start and this is why he is a great starting point for evolutionary theory uh, theorist, like to the way we think of it today. But it's not 100% correct. His theory of evolution is incorrect as he doesn't understand how traits are inherited, nor did he understand an organism's behavior has no effect on its inheritable traits. So he was the first one to develop a scientific theory of evolution, though, and realize that organisms are best adapted to their environments. Thomas Malthus, he published an essay on human population in 1798. He, he said that resources control populations and that this here influenced Darwin on his ideas about an organism's struggle for existence. He said that if the human population continued to grow unchecked, sooner or later there would be insufficient living space and food for everyone. The only circumstances that would affect this would be war, famine, and disease. So here we have this lovely graph where you see that the population growth will grow in this S curve because we get this carrying capacity line where if there isn't, uh, if the population is unchecked, we would eventually hit a limiting factor like food and it would stay constant in nature. And the only circumstances that will affect this affected growth is going to be war, famine, and disease because if there's famine, then that carrying capacity line is gonna go down. If there's a war, we're gonna get a, a sudden decrease in population. Same thing for disease. Alfred Wallace sends a manuscript on natural selection to Darwin in 1858, and he published that year. And then Charles Darwin, he was a naturalist, which is, as I said earlier, uh, what we would now know as a biologist. He set forth on his ship, the HMS Beagle, in 1831, and made observations in the Galapagos Islands where he studied reptiles and finches. And one of the things that he noticed was the differences uh, in the finches on each island. He started writing The Origin of Species in 1844. However, it wasn't published until 1859. And this is kind of due to the fact that he was a bit of a perfectionist and he wanted to make sure that everything he was writing was, uh, was fully detailed and an accurate representation of what he did. He cataloged his observations, leading to his idea that all organisms come from a common ancestor. And he argued that just as new organisms come from pre-existing organisms, each new species has to come from a previous species. So this is called descent with modification. So increased fitness will arise from adaptations. So certain adaptations will allow organisms to become better suited to their environment, and thus they will be better able to survive and to reproduce. So it, looking at it this way, we have a giraffe that has a, long, a longer neck than the other giraffes. It can reach the higher leaves on the trees better, and it's going to mate and it's going to have its kids, which with through DNA, it's going, uh, it may have that adaptation. If it has that adaptation, we're going to have more and more giraffes with longer necks. Eventually, what can happen is the two breeds of giraffes may eventually not be able to breed. 
uh, through some form or another. And if they're not able to breed, then we eventually get speciation and we get two new spe or we get a, a new species of giraffes. And that adaptation that allows them to eat uh, more food and survive better allowed this to create a new species. Now, the biggest thing is the adaptation must be best suited for survival and reproduction. If, it, if we cannot reproduce, then the adaptation is not going to be passed on. This is also known as survival of the fittest. So natural selection is the mechanism of evolution. What do you think this means? Uh, write it down and next class, bring it in. We'll be talking about it. So I'd like you to explain natural selection in your own words using genetic variation, adaptation, overpopulation, and struggle for existence. Make it a minimum of five sentences. All right. And that's it for today's lecture. Uh, make sure you continue on and double checking and looking because we're going to continue on this unit with evolution and it's going to be uh, a unit that's going to be broken down in many, di uh, many different videos. So keep watching and have a great rest of your evening.